All right, so if we're, we're all right with that, we'll move on to the next project, um, which is called Nano Restart, um, which is really an acronym for nanomaterials for use in the conservation or restoration of modern contemporary art. And this was an EU funded project um, through the Horizon 2020 program. It had 27 partners, very large indeed, and was uh, led by Professor Piero Baglioni uh, of the University of Florence, uh, a company, sort of a company that comes off that, as a wing off that, called CSGI. Professor Baglioni has actually been involved in creating uh, materials for conservation for a very long time, inspired by, he tells me, the, the Florence floods in 1966, where he was a student and witnessed it. So uh, the project involved a number of universities, a number of museums and a number of industrial partners. And the aim was, in, was to create products which would enable us to uh, treat modern contemporary art and there were about four or five different conservation challenges within that. Um, and the one that we were most involved in was about cleaning. So um, at Tate, I designed the project around case study treatments. Um, and we had three altogether, but I'm only gonna speak about one of them, which is the second one, the Liechtenstein painting, Wham. So in the first six months, we spent a long time analyzing and deciding which paintings uh, would be, or which works of art would be part of this project. And that really did involve a lot of the time um, trying to get works off the wall for the first time in a long time, which is not always an easy thing to do in a big museum. So we managed to get Wham off the wall and um, we actually um, offered the research treatment as a secondment for staff and the person who applied to that and was awarded that was again Rachel Barker. So of course um, when treating a painting for the first time such as Wham, one of the things we do is work out what the paint types are um, and I have a graphic which shows um, we know that the white in this painting was actually the priming so it's not an applied white layer apparently Liechtenstein went on to use titanium white paint later but at this point in his career, he was only using the priming as the white. So that was an algod based priming, which is very commonly used. Uh, he also used a projector to create the drawing and project it onto the canvas. So there are actually very visible pencil lines all over this work. The background is the famous Bende dots, which Lichtenstein used throughout his career, which were created by using a stencil. And at this point in time, I understand he was using metal stencils um, and he used oil paint because it took a while to dry so he could actually pull the stencil off. If he was using a fast drying paint, the stencil would get stuck to the canvas. So what he did was he used a toothbrush and he pushed the paint through the stencil. And so the dots, um, they create a color. Um, they're meant to mimic printing, of course, but they're actually quite uneven depending on what he's doing with the, with the toothbrush. And then uh, a lot of the colours, so the yellow and the red and the blacks on this painting are actually acrylic solution paints. So we have three different types of paint and we have pencil lines and we have a large work that's unframed, un well it has an L-shaped frame on it actually, but it's unglazed and it's not varnished. So all of those kind of tricky problems around modern contemporary paintings. It's also uh, a very well loved work of art in Tate's collection and it's very frequently on display. So the speech bubble area on the left hand panel actually uh, is a mixture of oil and magna paint um, and Liechtenstein is quite well known for blending oil and magna paint and that created quite a conservation challenge. So um, this sums up essentially what our key problems were. We had this incredibly water sensitive speech bubble. We had a water sensitive Bende dot background. We had a mineral spirit solvent sensitive magna paint. Then the entire surface was mechanically uh, sensitive. In other words, if you used a swab on it, you would pull pigment off. So we had a very delicate work of art which had quite a substantial soiling layer on it. 
So once again, we followed the same methodology. We created some mock-ups, and here we have uh, Rachel Barker again, um, and I think that might be one of our scientists who worked on the project, uh, looking at creating some of the magna paint samples. So we have some magna paint uh, mock-ups here, red, yellow, and black, and we have some rather less precise oil bende dot <laughs> mock-ups there, and we have them aging in our chamber. And we also soiled them using some artificial soil, which we use quite frequently in our research. We then aged them after we'd soiled them, so the soil was more difficult to remove. The methodology we used involved a whole group of things. We used tried and tested conservation examination methods, lots of photography, UV photography, um, and we used a group of scientific techniques as well infrared spectroscopy, um, atomic force microscopy, all sorts of things um, in order to uh, look at the surface and to establish um, the effects of treatment and to minimise any risk. So this is a very large list of cleaning systems, but if you focus on the, on the map on the right hand side, this is kind of following our thinking process around the choice of cleaning systems bearing in mind we have water sensitive and solvent sensitive paint on this painting. So uh, we're thinking about surface cleaning, so we were thinking about, we got to the point we, where we knew we had to wet clean, which means we're using water or something else. And we'd ruled out dry cleaning, which is often the use of sponges and things like that, because um, the paint is sensitive to that kind of mechanical action. So we knew we were going to deal with uh, the wet world, if you like. Um, so we looked at water, we looked at some solvents, and we ru ruled a few of them out because the paints are too sensitive. Um, we ruled out some of the uh, more novel cleaning systems like microemulsions because they're based on solvents that weren't appropriate. And then, so we ended up with water as being the best uh, solvent, and we ended up trying to optimise the activity of water and then we decided we had to confine it. We had to put it in some kind of gel in order to control its behavior and to minimize any mechanical action. So we then trialed a group of gels, um, some of which um, people have been using here in the workshop and will be using tomorrow. Um, we looked at emulsifiers and gels of different types, rigid gels, spreadable gels, all sorts of different gels. Um, and we ended up uh, with a particular type of gel at the end, which I'll describe for you. And here we have Rachel going through that initial phase of trying to optimise the water um, once we decided we were going to work with aqueous chemistry. Um, again, trialling and trialling and trialling on the mock-ups, uh, working out what was working best, how the paints responded to these systems. We had Excel files, we used star diagrams and all sorts of charts to, to document what we were doing as well as a lot of microscopy. Once we did that, we ended up looking at all the gels. And you can see here in the middle is something called a star diagram, which we're using to um, just, I guess, map out some of our observations in a way that's uh, visually um, quite easy to see, although it looks quite complicated standing here right now. Um, range of gels we used uh, that are quite commonly used on modern contemporary paint surfaces now. Um, silicon gels, a range of the gels in the middle, which come straight from the NanoRest art project, and then things that people reach for quite frequently, agar and gel and gum. So we tried all of those things, and we're looking at things like soiling removal. Is it efficient? Um, is it doing anything on, we don't want to the surface? Is it picking up pigment? Is it changing gloss? How easy is it to use it? Do you have to spend three days getting it just right, or is it an easy thing to use, which is actually a key parameter? Health and safety, uh, we need it to be non-toxic preferably. Um, and are there any residues left behind, which is also something we think about in conservation. We don't want to leave a legacy of our treatment on the surface. So this is um, a little sideways step now to talking about the nanorestart gels. They were being produced as part of this project in collaboration with um, CSGI. And I'm hoping, actually, the video is not going to work, but you can see the middle image, um, that's how um, free-flowing and flexible some of the gels are that they're producing. And that is quite unique to conservation. A lot of the gels we have are quite rigid or spreadable, but we've got nothing in between. 
and that's what they were aiming to do, to provide a quite a flexible gel. And down here we have uh, an image of this gel, and you can see there are tiny, tiny pores in that uh, gel of different sizes. Some of those pores are in the nano scale and some of them are in the micro scale. So that's where they get the name nano gels. So we were playing with three different types, um, but for WAM we were only working with two. Um, they are synthetic polymers. They're based on um, polyvinyl acetate polymers generally. Um, and they go through a particular manufacturing process where they are dissolved in water and then frozen and thawed for a number of cycles to create the gel with the right porosity, the right flexibility and the right tackiness or stickiness. And that process of making the gels and going through those cycles and then cleaning them is what uh, contributes to the cost of them. They're not super expensive but they're not as cheap as anthem gum. So you can see there's a degree of transparency in these gels and there's a, a quite a lot of flexibility. They look a little bit like uncooked squid, which is, but they don't smell like uncooked squid, which is good. So then we were working with these gels because they ended up being the most appropriate for WAM um, because they offered a flexibility which meant that we could get the soil out of the canvas weave without putting pressure on the gel or on the paint. Um, so here we are trialling different aqueous systems in these gels. Um, we ended up working with um, trimonium citrate, which is a common um, chelating agent which helps with the cleaning process. We also did some due diligence studies where we looked at residues of these gels because we don't want to leave anything behind and we worked with CSGI to explore that using infrared spectroscopy mapping. Um, and these, these rather um, blobby blue diagrams down here effectively tell us there was none of that residue of the gel left behind after a very long exposure, much longer than what we're going to use on the painting. So we got to the final stages, again a bit like with the Rothko treatment where we were really interested in, we spent a long time uh, testing and trialling and making sure we were right and um, doing a lot of um, playing around with different systems with all these gels and we ended up using trimonium citrate at various concentrations across the work. So we ended up using one system which is ideal but we did tweak the concentration of the cleaning system. Here you can see the gel um, placed on the surface of the painting um, and in the early days we were using a mylar template and a cutout which corresponded to the composition shapes which is a good way to approach a painting this large. Um, we ended up, as Rachel became more confident using these gels, we ended up doing away with those templates but at the beginning when we were more cautious we ended up using those. And here we have some tests on the magna paint. All of these tests were done in small uh, discrete ways at the beginning before we applied the larger sheets of the gel. So um, we, we were playing with the amount of trimonium citrate in the gels um, and seeing what kind of cleaning level we could achieve and whether it was even um, and whether it was uh, acceptable in terms of the gloss that was left behind after cleaning. So again, that was uh, around six months of work um, and then Rachel, actually it was about nine months of work and then Rachel got to the whole, the process where she was ready to go. Um, and the actual cleaning of both panels took three months. And it's quite a production line because you've got gels that are cleaning gels, you've got gels that are clearance gels, and you've got gels that you've used that are dirty that are being cleaned overnight. So it's quite a, a process. So it's really a two-person job to keep this going. Um, so she would apply the gel onto the surface. Um, we ended up using a two-minute exposure through testing and trialling. Then she'd gently pull the, the gel off the surface and then she'd apply a clearance gel which had just had deionized water in it for two minutes and then pull that off. And you can see hopefully in the bottom uh, middle there there's a, a, an area, a square that's been cleaned of the priming and, and just how uh, successful that cleaning was. We were very conscious of not over cleaning this painting um, so we were able to achieve an even clean eventually. And you can see in these um, dirty beakers down here, how dirty the water was after you're cleaning the gel. 
it was quite a yellowed soil that we were removing. And up here you can see perhaps that the gel is quite dirty after we'd taken it off the painting. In all in all, there were 150 gel sheets used on these two panels. So that's a, a, a relative investment. Uh, however, we couldn't clean this painting really without using these gels. We wouldn't have used agar because it needs weighting and it drops too much water onto the surface. We wouldn't have used gelin either. Too stiff, needs weighting. These were amazing because you could just gently um, roll them onto the surface and then gently pull them off again, which is quite unique. So um, this is during cleaning. The left-hand panel is clean and the right-hand panel is not clean. And as with all modern contemporary art treatments, you can barely see a difference. However, um, perhaps the conservators in the room can see that the right-hand panel is a little bit hazier and has a, a slightly more yellowed look to it than the left-hand panel. So we were able to recover a, a real sense of saturation. Um, we it, we um, recovered the brightness of the colours without over-cleaning the painting and making it look too bright. And here is the ubiquitous shot in the gallery with the young person staring in, intently at the work of art, which is, as I said before, a common way of uh, showing after treatment shots at Tate. Um, and there it is back in the uh, very uh, quite light gallery space that it's, it's in at the moment. And um, a film was also made of this treatment, not as long as the Rothko film, actually, because this painting was going to went to Liverpool after the the um, fin after we completed the treatment, um, so it actually has the installation of the work in Liverpool, as well as some interviews with Rachel and I and other people who were involved uh, in the treatment. So once again, we had a video, which is a really nice way of capturing some of those non-academic things about the treatment and their feelings and the stories of the people involved, which can be which are valid meanings to this work because we're all stakeholders in these works of art being back on the wall and um, uh, hopefully lasting into the future without needing another cleaning treatment for another 50 years. Let's hope, that's the aim. Um, but now we know how to clean this painting and now we also know how to clean um, an Ava Hesse sculpture which has been problematic for a very long time in Tate's collection. In the case of the Ava Hesse, uh, we also used the same gels, slightly modified, um, and they worked very well indeed. And so that's now back on the wall. So they are a really interesting um, development, I think, uh, in conservation. Of course, they're not um, the golden answer to every problem, but they, they very much deserve a place in the toolbox because sometimes they offer unique properties that can particularly tackle some of the challenges we're facing. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, there's a very um, invisible link there to an article. <laughs> um, don't use blue font is the take home um, for me. Um, that is an open access article for anyone who's really interested in the details of the WAM treatment. Um, it is now open access and a Springer publication in Heritage Science. And, and when I get back to the UK, all being well, the HESA one will be published within a couple of weeks. So thank you very much.